Good morning. How you guys doing? Good? Yeah, that's what's up. I'm doing good. I'm doing better I'm now. Great. Who said that? I'm Thank great. you. What's up? Good morning. I'm Kayla, and uh, right next to me I have... Chris. You guys recognize this guy? <laughs> he looks the same. He never ages. So, <laughs> so Chris Kim is back on staff. Oh. What is up? We're so glad to have you back. So you were here on staff the first time for how long? 15 and a half years. 15 and a half years. That's so long. The only person who's been here longer than you is like Rod. That's crazy. Kyle, maybe. Rod and Kyle. Don't tell him I said that. Hey. He's watching online. I know things sometimes happen in the church and you guys don't know, but I did not want this weekend to go by without us just recognizing and celebrating the fact that this guy is back with us. We're super happy to Thank have you. Thank you. Very happy to be back. All right. Enough about me. It's super weird. Uh, <laughs> um, let me tell you about some things that are going on in the life of our church. Um, next weekend is the Global 5K Race. woo -hoo! Thank you, Kayla. And... You again, yes, thank you. Um, we're gonna get more excited. We've got 100, over 100 people who have registered already. That's amazing. But if you haven't registered yet, this is your last chance. Have you registered? I have not registered. I have not registered either. But if you are in person, you'd like to register, go visit the, uh, the table out in the lobby. Our good friend Valerie will take care of all of the details. If you are watching online, you can visit our website. Um, but here's the thing, it's not just a race this year. Uh, okay. We're celebrating the 30th anniversary of the Children of Promise. Awesome. That should give a little bit more excitement. So actually, can I add to that? Yes, you may. So we, our goal as a church was to sponsor 50 kids and we've already sponsored like over half, which is amazing. A huge answer to prayer. So we've added more. So that's also part of why we're running as well. Yes. And amazing. in order, in, in, in good fashion to celebrate. There's gonna be cake, there's gonna be a bounce yeah. house, there's gonna be face painting, you name it, it's gonna be there. You don't wanna miss out. I heard that Ronnie is gonna be grilling, by the way. Well, then I'm there. So I'm, I'm gonna register right now. I'm, I'm just there. gonna go. Yeah, let's go. Okay. Um, another exciting thing that's happening in our house is night of worship is upon us. I'm gonna be there. Kayla's gonna be there. Hopefully these good looking folks behind us are gonna be there. Um, Join us May 25th, 5 p.m. outside, block party, coffee, food, drink. Games. Games. That's cornhole. What I was, cornhole. Everybody loves cornhole, right? One person likes cornhole. <laughs> I like cornhole. That, that's all right. You know, we're going to get there. We're going to get there this morning. Um, the evening's going to start at 7 p.m. If you have children from newborn to pre-K, there is childcare, but spots are limited, so you want to sign up right now right now. I won't be offended. So we also have summer small groups. I know that it feels like too early to start talking about summer, but it's already here, which is crazy. So summer small groups are going to start on June 5th. So 5th. If you are not signed up for a small group, if you haven't been in one, if you're like me and you do better with like one-on-one, -on -one, I can stand up here all day long and talk, but when it comes to like large groups or like parties, I'm like... I can't do it. So if you do better one-on-one, -on -one, if you want people to really walk through life with you, if you want people to study the word of God with you, if you want people who are like-minded, I know it's hard to sometimes meet those types of people. Those people are here in your church and I would love for you guys to all be in a small group. So if you're not in one, sign up for one in the lobby, online. You can ask me, I'll help you. Chris will help you. It'll be great. And then the last thing is we couldn't do any of this without you guys, literally. This place runs off of your tithes alone. So from the bottom of our hearts, thank you so much for your generosity. There are so many different ways that you can give that I can't memorize them all. But you can go online, you can text people, you can do it old fashioned in the back of the sanctuary. There's so many different ways. Thank you so much for how faithful you guys have been to this house. It has meant the world to us. Um, and the last thing that I have to say up here is I'm actually going to invite a couple of people up here. So would you guys all come up, give them a hand? Yeah. So we do a lot of things around here, but one of the things that we love to do is send people out. Send our people out to go and just be Jesus in the world. Um, so this group of people, they are from Transit, and they are going on a mission trip. Can you, Andrea, can you introduce your team? Like 
Yes. <laughs> okay, you're going to use this one. Hey everyone, I'm Andrea, um, and this is our team. This is Pamela, Emma, and Izzy, and we are going to Columbia on Friday. Yes, um, and so we'll be doing a few different service um, outreach activities. Um, one of them will be passing out bikes to some kids, and then we're bringing them back to have a movie night and a craft. Um, and then we are going to a couple of nursing homes to just love on the people there. Um, and then we are going to be hosting a lunch for women who are the sole source of income for their families. Um, and we're just going to spoil them pretty much, um, feed them lunch. Um, and yeah, just love on them, talk to them, pray over them. So yeah. Sorry, I don't have a mic. So Izzy, um, can you let us know a little bit about how we can be praying for you guys? You guys are gonna be doing so many amazing things. So what can we be praying specifically for? Um, yeah, well, of course we need protection of health, safe travels, all of those just physical needs that we need to be able to do the trip. Um, but I was thinking about our mission and what we're really going there to do is to serve so that we're able to share the gospel. We're caring for physical needs so that we can share the love of Christ through that. Um, so just prayers that we're able to, um, be courageous by making bold leadership choices, but also like walking in humility, knowing that we're entering into a new environment with new people. And it's not our job to just implement ourselves into their lives and then leave. We're there to share the love of Christ, get to know them, and really honestly to be learners of their community. So just prayers that we are humble um, and courageous and that we have safe travels. Very cool. Hey, so as a church family, can we just pray for them real quick? Just bow your heads and we'll just pray together. Um, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this courageous group of young adults. We thank you for their hearts to serve. We thank you that you have put um, this fire in their heart um, that really is just your love for others. God, um, scripture says that people will know us by our love for God and our love for others. And God, I pray that that would just be so transparent that it would fly across any language barrier, anything that um, would prevent you from being known in this place wherever they go. God, I pray that nobody would ever be able to mistake them as anything other than your hands and your feet in that place. God, I pray that you would give them um, just your insight, your wisdom, your understanding as they go and enter into this place, like Izzy said, and, and to just really do whatever is actually needed. God, whatever you are actually trying to do in that place, God, I pray for an alignment with your spirit. God, I pray that um, just your joy and your fruit would just be evident in that place. God, I pray that not only would they change the area that they're entering in Colombia, but they would also leave change themselves, God, that we would just, through them, also be able to gain just a stronger understanding of how much you love us and how really anything that we do is only because of you. Everything that we have, everything that we do, may we all just give it back to you. God, we love you. We just pray a blessing and a protection over these people. And we pray this in your son's powerful name. Amen. Well, good morning. It is great to see all of you. Um, I just want to say, I hope you appreciate the, uh, the magnitude of leadership that was on this stage just now. Um, Andrea and Izzy are both, Andrea is a fellow, part of our residential uh, program here for people who are interested in going into vocational ministry. And Izzy is part of our first round of trellis students. So she is working here at the church while pursuing her undergraduate degree. And, uh, and so I know both of them well, and I also know several other members of the team really well. And um, you guys can be really proud of the men and women that you are sending to Columbia this week. They are uh, exceptional people, and I cannot wait to hear about, uh, about what God does through them and about what they learn about God when they get back. Well, uh, welcome church. Welcome to those of you who are here in the room, those of you that are online. My name is Jessica Eitflecht. I am one of the youth pastors here at Fairfax, and um, it's great to be with you this morning. We are continuing our eight-week study on the letter to the Ephesians this week. Uh, so we started this two weeks ago. Rod did the first week two weeks ago, and then last week we took a little break. Uh, Christy Hayes was here with us, a, a longtime friend of our church for Mother's Day last week, and uh, if you didn't get a chance 
chance to hear that message, and I encourage you to go back and listen to it. The same with Rod's from, uh, from a week ago. Um, but so we took a little break. So this is just week two, and, um, and we are, are going to talk a lot about chapter two today. But, uh, but first, as Rod talked about two weeks ago, Ephesus was a powerful city where uh, Paul spent about three years in his ministry. And uh, from that initial church in Ephesus that he was, that was there working in, there were a number of other churches that were planted both in the city and in the surrounding areas. And this letter doesn't contain a whole lot of personal details, which if you've spent much time in, um, in Paul's letters, then uh, you maybe would notice that this letter doesn't contain a lot of personal greetings or talk about personal circumstances of what was happening with the people at the church that it was addressed to. And that's something that would maybe stand out to you, uh, if, you if you were paying attention to that. And um, there's a lot of different possibilities for reasons out there like that. But one of them, a pretty strong one, is that this particular letter was intended to be more of a circular letter. So it was written to uh, the churches in Ephesus, but because it was kind of a, a powerful city, a pretty big city, then it would have, there were multiple churches in that area. And so maybe it goes to one particular church, but then it gets read by all of the churches in the, in the city and kind of in the surrounding areas. It would be a little bit like if somebody sent a church to the churches in Washington, right? Or, uh, or sent a letter to the Washingtonians. And that church maybe made it to uh, a particular congregation somewhere you know, in the city, in the city limits. And, um, and then it would eventually go maybe to some other churches within the city and then maybe make its way even out to us. And if, if, a, if a letter, whether it was, I don't know, an email or in like a journal or in a newspaper or whatever, if a, if a letter was addressed to the churches in Washington or to the Washingtonians, then we would get that and we would relate to that on some level, right? Like we wouldn't completely disregard that as not being for us. And so it's similar, but you couldn't, if we were to read a letter like that and it was full of personal details about a particular congregation located somewhere else that we didn't maybe have a relationship with, um, then that would maybe not make a lot of sense to us. It wouldn't be a, as valuable a letter for us. And so, um, so that's a, a possibility for why there's not a lot of personal details or personal information in here like Paul does with several of his other, uh, of his other letters. So, uh, so this was kind of a circular letter, and so it's got a pretty broad audience. And, uh, and though it has a broad audience, it has a pretty direct agenda. Uh, the lay, so it's trying to lay out for its readers, who would primarily be hearers, because um, probably if you were getting this letter, you would not be reading it for yourself. You would be gathering together, say, on a Sunday morning with the rest of your church and having it read to you, possibly in place of the sermon. And so, uh, so for the most part, people are hearing this letter, not necessarily reading this letter, but its agenda is pretty direct. It's an explanation of who Christ is, the role of the church, and then what it means to live as a believer. And so in chapter one, we get this beautiful depiction of praise and thanksgiving for who the triune God is. It, it acknowledges God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, this triune God about who God is and, uh, and the work of salvation that God has done on behalf of all of us and of how we are to respond to God with the way that we live our lives. And this is followed by a prayer for the believers in the churches that God might give them wisdom and knowledge and understanding about God's activity and God's power in the world. It's a pretty dense opening, but like we talked about two weeks ago, the bottom line is God is faithful to us all the time in every circumstance. And when we are united with Christ, we have already received all the riches of God's blessing, regardless of how much brokenness or woundedness or faithlessness we bring with us. So chapter one ends with this declaration that we in all of our messiness collectively are the church, that Jesus is the head of the church and that we as the church are the body of Christ here in the world. Now that's the end of chapter one, but the chapter and verse divisions that we find in our English Bibles don't really do us any favors here because arguably as we move into chapter two, it's really a continuation of the argument that was being made in chapter one. So I want to read it together uh, so that you can kind of see what I mean. We want to start today in Ephesians chapter 1. We're going to start in verse 20 and make our way into chapter 2. God's power was at work in Christ when God raised him from the dead and sat him at God's right side in the heavens, far above every ruler and authority and power and angelic power, any power that might be named not only now but in the future. God put everything under Christ's feet and made him head of everything in the church, which is his body, 
His body, the church, is the fullness of Christ who fills everything in every way. At one time, you were like a dead person because of the things you did wrong and your offenses against God. You used to act like most people in our world do. You followed the rule of a destructive spiritual power. This is the spirit of disobedience to God's will that is now at work in persons whose lives are characterized by disobedience. At one time, you were like those persons. All of you used to do whatever felt good and whatever you thought you wanted so that you were children headed for punishment just like everyone else. Okay, so notice that we start in verse 20 with Christ is dead, but God's power has brought Christ back to life. And in a further demonstration of God's power, God has put everything under Christ's feet, including uh, the church, which is us collectively. And then as the passage says, speaking of the church, speaking of you, um, remember when you were dead? Do you remember specifically when you were, uh, when you were like a dead person? In fact, one translation puts it, remember when you used to just exist, walking around like a corpse because you were buried by your wrongs and offenses against God? And I don't know about you, I don't know, so probably some of you in this room hear a passage like that and think, um, remember when you were dead? Uh, buried under your wrongs and offenses. And maybe that, doesn't, maybe that doesn't hit. Maybe that doesn't resonate with you. And I can understand that. I can understand um, that feeling like a little bit like, no, I don't. I don't have a recollection of walking around like a corpse just existing. But there are some of us who maybe have come face to face with our capacity for wrong and offense against God. There are some of us who know what it is like to walk around just existing, to walk around like a corpse because we are so buried by our transgressions against God, but so buried by our sin against God. And we are well aware of just how far we are willing to go uh, to do what it is that we want to do. If you have come face to face with your own capacity for wrongdoing and offending God, then you likely do not have a hard time understanding this metaphor. Regardless, we all have been owned by sin. We all have been guilty of falling hook, line, and sinker for the persuasive passions of this world. And as one translation put it, we have all indulged the flesh, done what we wanted instead of what we knew was right, and said whatever as we went on our way. And lest we who are sitting here think that we are any better, Ephesians 2 tells us right up front that no, no, we are not. We were all under the rule of a destructive spiritual power who was leading us only one way towards destruction and punishment and death. It is a bleak picture that's being painted to us for us in this first part of chapter two, for sure. Um, and it reminds us of our propensity for sin, of our weakness in the face of temptation and the obvious conclusion that we, of what it is that we are heading towards if we remain on this path. And then look at verse four, but God, we're just gonna stop right there. But, but God, church, we were headed for punishment just like everyone else, but God. My marriage was headed for destruction, but God. My addiction was going to ruin my life, but God. Come on, my anger was going to drive my children away from me for good, but God. I couldn't stop lying to those that I thought would never trust me again, but God. There was racism and prejudice in my heart towards others, but God. My greed, my hunger for more had consumed me, but God. I don't know what your but God statement is this morning, but I hope that you know whatever it is, that we serve the God of but. That when everything is looking hopeless, that God inserts a but. That when you were at the end of you, God is just beginning. The God of but shows up more than once in scripture. And every time you see it, you should be reminded that when you think there is nothing left, that God is just getting started. And if you think that we don't tell our students in the hangar that they serve a but God, then you are kidding yourselves and you think we are much more mature than we actually are. Um, we absolutely call God the but God in the hangar. So I gave you the grown up version. Some of you though had already gone there. I could see you talking to one another. You're like, why is she saying it like that? That's weird. Because I was trying to keep you with me before, okay. All right, so uh, we were headed for punishment just like everyone else but God. 
verse four, the rest of verse four, who is rich in mercy out of the great love with which God loved us. Let's just stop right there again. I wanna land on that phrase, who is rich in mercy for just one second. The Greek word that gets translated as mercy here is a little bit of an undersell. The word is elios, which is a five letter word that has not popped up in my Wordle yet, though I keep trying it. Um, is anybody still playing that? Anybody still playing Wordle? Thank you, a few of you, thank you. Um, and so uh, anyway, this is the Greek form of the Hebrew word hased, which is arguably one of the most important theological words in the Old Testament, that God is rich in elios, that God is rich in hased. New York Times bestselling author Anne Voskamp just released a book called Waymaker, which is unrelated to the song, in case you're wondering. And uh, this is a key part of what God has been teaching her lately. She describes it this way. Hesed is the forever covenantal, always unconditionally, unwaveringly loyal, kind love of inseparable bonding, of divine family, of eternal attachment. This is who God is. The God of Hesed. Elios love, the God of mercy, covenantal, unconditional, unwavering love and mercy. Out of the great love with which God loved us, it's in there twice for emphasis in the text. Verse five, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved and raised up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the ages to come, God might show the immeasurable riches of God's grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. We should just close in prayer. I'm not sure what more there is to add to that. Um, This God saw us dead in our trespasses, in our wrongs and our offenses, and made us alive again because by grace, we have been saved. So let's circle back and remember where we started uh, in verse 20, back in chapter one. So God raised up Christ and seated Christ above all the rulers and powers and authorities of this world, placing everything in it under his feet. And now the God of covenantal, unwavering mercy and kindness has raised us up and seated us with Jesus in the heavenly place. Why? Why did God do this? According to the text, so that in the ages to come, God might show the immeasurable riches of God's grace in kindness towards us. Put it this way, God loves us so much that God raised us up so that God might show us how much God loves us. Here and again, God chooses to love you simply because he chooses you to love. God wants to be with you because he wants to be with you. He has said loves you because he has said loves you. And this is the perfect circular logic of love. God simply wants you to be with you, to love you, and also to show those who will come after you how good God is. It is about us, but it is also about so much more than us. It is about us, but it is also about how God will use us to show God's glory to those who do not yet know the Hesed love of God. And just in case, after all of that, someone still thinks that this is about something good that they did or they were responsible for, we have verse eight. For by grace you have been saved, through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. This is maybe the verse that you are familiar with, but don't let the familiarity diminish its impact. In fact, let's read it again from a different translation. For it is by God's grace that you have been saved, you receive it through faith. It was not our plan or our effort, it is God's gift, pure and simple. You didn't earn it, not one of us did, so don't go around bragging that you must have done something amazing. The Hesed Elios love of God is what compels God to extend grace. God extends grace because of who God is. God chooses to love you simply because God chooses you to love, is what Anne said. Not because of anything that you've done or haven't done, just because it's you. Because God created you and loves you and extends grace to you. Not by works. Not by my ability to follow the rules or to stay in the lines, not by my sin avoidance, however skilled at that I might be. It's not about how many times I went to church or how often I listened to Christian music. It's not even about how well I serve others or how genuinely I fight for the cause of the oppressed. There are no human activities or efforts that you or I can perform 
to gain favor with God and gain salvation. It is both frustrating and freeing. It's frustrating because we all find ourselves caught in that cycle of trying to prove our worthiness to God, of trying to gain God's favor, of trying to uh, get God's approval. It's so easy to say, but look at all the good things that I did. Look at all the ways that I'm making straight A's at being a Christian, right? But it is also freeing because it means I can look at each one of you today and say with complete confidence that you are who God wants, just as you are that you don't have to strive to be God wants, that you don't have to work to be who God wants. You just are. You don't have to do to be who God wants. In my personal Bible reading lately, I have, uh, I've just finished, I've just about finished, I've got like one day left, uh, working through a study on Deuteronomy. And, um, And we've just been reading through it in the study chapter or two at a time. And um, I've read Deuteronomy a couple of times before, uh, but I've been doing this study. And can I be honest with you guys? I don't know if pastors are supposed to say this. It's been a bit of a slog. It's not been awesome. And uh, part of the reason that it's not been awesome is because I've been trying to get up early in the morning, like before other people are up, um, and and do it then. And um, mornings are not my jam. Like, like, just, I just don't, I, I don't function well in the mornings. It doesn't matter. And listen, I re- recognize if I were to tell you what time I consider to be getting up early, some of you would laugh in my face, right? But it's still early for me, and I'm trying. Um, but if I don't do it, like, 90 to- 98 times out of 100, if I don't do it, like, first thing in the morning, then I'm not going to come back to it. And so I've been trying really hard to get up early and to do it. But that is part of the reason, I think, why it's not been awesome, because that is not my finest hour. The other reason it hasn't been awesome is, again, if I'm honest, I don't love the study. The study hasn't been great. You know, if you do a Bible study maybe that somebody else has written, then sometimes there's like thoughts on the passage that you've read, and maybe that resonates with you, but sometimes it doesn't. I don't love this one, but it's the one that I picked, and so like I'm like, I've convinced myself that I just need to keep showing up, right? That what matters is that I keep showing up, I keep doing the thing. What matters is the with time with God, the prayer time that I'm getting out of it, that that something, I'm getting something out of it, even if I don't love it. But again, you know, just between you and me, if I'm being totally honest, there are days when I get out to my spot on the couch and I just cannot keep my eyes open. And... I can't hardly keep them open enough to read the words on the pages of my Bible. So I don't. I fall back asleep on Jesus. And listen, uh, there have been times, there have been seasons in my faith where confessing that to you would be like confessing the most mortal of sins, right? Where I understood that it was my job as a follower of Jesus to have however long you want quiet time with God every day. You're supposed to do it first thing in the morning. When you get up, there's the check boxes you're supposed to follow and that to not do it, in fact, to fall asleep on God when you're supposed to be doing it is like the worst of sins that you could commit. That for sure has been my understanding. Like the disciples in the garden. Can I not even stay awake for this one hour, right? There have been those seasons, but this is not that season. And maybe I will be in that season again. But uh, right now in this season, I don't think what God wants for me is exhaustion and obligation. I mean, at least I don't want someone to feel obligated and exhausted when they're trying to spend time with me. Take a nap, it's fine. Our relationship will survive. So hear this, your standing with God isn't based on anything that you do or don't do. It's based on what Jesus already did. You don't have to do to be with God. And if you are here today and you have been doing the opposite of trying to gain God's favor or approval, then I can also say to you, you are who God wants. You don't have to fix anything first or quit anything first or get anything together. You don't have to do to be who God wants either. Your lack of works does not disqualify you any more than my attempts to read my Bible in the morning is qualifying me. For it is by grace that we have been saved through faith and not by works so none of us can boast. But we're not quite done. 
Just because the works doesn't, don't save us doesn't mean there isn't a place for good works in our faith. For we are God's workmanship, verse 10 says, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. We are God's workmanship. We are among the things that God made that reveal who God is. We are the handiwork of God in the NIV. We are the accomplishment of God in the Common English Bible. But perhaps my favorite is this one. For we are the product of God's hand, heaven's poetry etched on lives, created in the anointed Jesus. We tell our students in the hangar all the time that you were created on purpose for a purpose that nothing about you is a mistake, that you are not God's beta test, that you were created with intentionality on purpose. And not just for fun either, you were created for a purpose, that there is something that you have been placed on this earth to do that contributes to the bringing forth of God's kingdom here on earth, that you have a job to do, have a reason for being here that contributes to the redemption and reconciliation of all things in the new heaven and the new earth, right? That, that you have a reason for being here right now. For while your works will not save you, you are the workmanship of God and so you have work to do. When we say yes to God, when we exercise that faith and enter into a relationship with the creator, we become a new creation and that is not the end of our story. That is just the beginning of the work that God wants to do in us and through us. We're not saved to bide our time until heaven or to get our ticket punched for our eternal destination. We're saved so that we can respond to God's gift of grace by doing that which God has prepared for us to do. But don't get the steps mixed up. At this point, it would be tempting for many of us to kind of jump to the end and say, well, what's on my to-do list? What are the things that God has called me to do? Like, what is it that I'm supposed to be doing here on this earth? But there are two steps that come first and we have to go in order. The first step is God's grace, but guess what? Good news for all of you type A, Washington DC type people. Um, every single one of you already has step one done. All the box checkers can check that one off the list. Jesus checked that one off the list 2,000 years ago. The second is our faith. We respond to the grace by believing in Jesus, by exercising our faith. And if you haven't done this before, then today, is a good day to do it. It's not our faith that saved us, grace saves us, but the exercise of our faith, when we, when we accept that, that is the exercise of our faith. And, uh, and today is a good day to exercise your faith. All you have to do is say yes to the God who created you and loves you and wants to be with you. And then the third step is this, good works. What is the good work that God has for you to do? What is the purpose for which you have been created? Maybe you figured that out already, maybe not. No one can do steps two and three for you. That is yours to do. But if you are looking for someone to help or to talk to, then we would love to do that. If you need to say yes to Jesus today, then we can help you do that. And if you're looking for a way to engage and serve and do good, we have lots of ways for you to connect to the right spot. So while we can't do it for you, we can come alongside you and we would be honored. But I wanna to speak to a few of you in the moment, in the room for just a moment. Some of you have been feeling a stirring in your heart for quite some time now. It's maybe this thing that you keep coming back to when you're still before God, maybe in moments just like this one. And it's this idea or a dream or just this thought, and it's just, right now, it's just this flicker somewhere inside of you, and you try mostly to ignore it because now is not the right time for whatever reason, but it's there. And if you're honest, you can't, you can't stop thinking about it. You can't keep ignoring it. And so for all sorts of reasons, it's just, you've let it just stay small, just this flicker, because the time isn't right, or the money isn't right, or the kids are too young, and it would mean going back to school. And listen, all of those are potentially valid reasons. But maybe God is telling you today that it's time to move on it. That it's time to give it some oxygen, to fan it into a flame and see what God can do with this idea, with this dream. For some of you, just thinking about it makes your heart beat just a little bit faster. And maybe that's your sign. 
regardless. Whether you need to start some new good works or continue on in the works that you've been doing for years now, may you remember today that God has said loves you, that God's grace has saved you, and you are now God's workmanship. And so it is time for you to go and do the work as one with heaven's poetry etched on your life. Let me pray for you. God, I believe us to be a called people. I believe us to be, each of us, called into ministry in one way or another. And so God, um, I pray for the men and women all across this room, some of them who have yet to exercise their faith and say yes to the grace that you have so freely offered. God, may we not skip step two. Even those of us who have maybe said yes many times before, maybe today might be another opportunity for us to say yes to the grace that you offer us. But God, I also want to pray for those of us who uh, maybe are feeling discouraged in the good work that you've called us to. We've been at it for so long. And it doesn't seem like it's getting any better doesn't seem like we're making a difference. May you encourage us to continue on in the way to which you have called us. And then God, for those of us who just in these moments have a flicker, may we tune in, give it our ear, hand it over to you and see what you might do with it. If today is the day to say yes to that God, then I pray that you would give us courage to do so. For all of us, God, we We are yours, we are your handiwork, we are your accomplishment. We claim that this morning. We thank you for your grace. We pray these things in the name of your son, Jesus, amen.